for coming today and, and being a part of this. It's, it, I find that a lot of students uh, are, are very interested in space. And I, I give this talk a lot. I've given it to just about anybody who will listen at, at the library a couple of times at, at uh, high schools and, and uh, grade school kids, and, but never to medical students. So this is a real treat for me. I'm, I'm grateful. And my son, I'm proud to say, is a second year medical student at Emory University in Atlanta. Um, so, uh, and I can't, for the life of me, get him interested in space. He's more interested in emergency medicine. So uh, I'll just jump right in if you don't mind. Please uh, feel free to interrupt if, if you like, uh, maybe, or, or text some questions and maybe Rowena or someone following the chat can, can let me know when something happens in that regard. Um, uh, I like to call this space dangers because it's all the things that make going to space a bad idea. But I'm gonna to try to make the point that we have to, and we have to do it soon. Um, and so let's jump right into it. We're not gonna talk about the engineering problems that we have, like how to stop uh, the, the foam from, from disintegrating on takeoff and then causing the, 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 uh, the Columbia to, to burn up on, on in coming in or the Challenger to explode at, the at takeoff. So those are all engineering proposals. I'm going to give you, this is our outline for the day. I'm going to give you some NASA proposals that I've worked on in the past. And, and I hope the president, we've got to still have a, um, an, an, uh, an interesting NASA proposal out I'd like to tell you about. So, um, but my background first, I graduated from Colorado State University in experimental physiological psychology, doing neural correlates of learning and memory in cats and bats and monkeys and, and uh, rats and mice and anything I could get my hands on. Uh, and that got me a position in, in the neurology clinic at the Lab of Cerebral Metabolism in Cornell University in New York City, where I, I worked on stroke and hypoglycemia. And, uh, it was incredible experience. Those guys have invented some of the most incredible treatments for, for stroke, invented the way to study stroke. And that got me a position at Park Davis Pharmaceutical, where we came up with the world's first anti-Alzheimer's medication in Cognex. Uh, and, and the mechanics of Cognex uh, are, are still used in, uh, in anti-Alzheimer's drugs today. Um, and then that got me a position with the Air Force, which was really the most incredible eye-opening thing I've ever done. I'm an Air Force brat, though. I've lived on Air Force bases all my life, so it was like coming home. Um, and that, that also got me a, a position uh, on the team that, that looked at uh, cognitive effects of microgravity in space, as well as uh, acceleration, um, centrifugation, pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical techniques for, for fighting fatigue and, um, and rhinitis, all kinds of things that plague pilots. And, and then I became, uh, uh, for some, somehow I got involved in being a software developer guy, um, but they liked the fatigue model that I created for making their, their war games and their uh, computer games that they, they had these great enormous battles that would go on for seven days and nobody would ever get sick or stressed or tired. And, and so I, I really messed it up by trying to make it more realistic. And, then, and the Navy and the Army both loved it quite a bit, made those, the company millions of dollars. And since they didn't give me any, I moved on to every riddle where I'm still working on biomathematical models and uh, and in particular, I'm very interested in spatial disorientation, especially in flight and in, in space. Uh, so 1994 was a pretty good year for me. Um, it was the 25th anniversary of the first manned moon landing, Apollo 11. Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet was cascading into, into Jupiter. And we got to see it, you know, from, from uh, at Huntsville, Alabama, the NASA center there. And, and it was pretty remarkable to see all the techniques they had to observe it. And then we had an experiment. As I mentioned, the PAUSE uh, Performance Assessment Workstation on mic in microgravity, it was the International Microgravity Lab, uh, was an attempt to find if, if microgravity affected cognitive ability. And we had some of the best cognitive psychologists on board, Doug Eddy, Robert Schlegel, Nyan Damos. And uh, this was the commander of the mission, um, Bob Cabana, was a, incredible guy. He's a Marine test pilot, astronaut uh, commander on two missions. He's, he was the astronaut commander for the entire brigade of astronauts at NASA. Now he's the assistant um, director of NASA. He's working his way up. Incredible man. Um, but he's like, um, you know, our, our goal was to find out how, how, how their ability to perform a test was affected by microgravity. Here's their performance on, uh, on the ground-based training sessions. 
And then as soon as we they launched, you could you could say a lot of this was the launch effect, but down around here, it's probably not the launch effect. It was something not not microgravity of effects of, uh, on their cognitive ability. It was fatigue. These guys are, were incredibly tired and NASA still has this fatigue problem. They've given them more, you know, better sedatives. They've given them um, more, um, uh, more rest time, but they still have this fatigue problem. And I think the answer to that is that it's a special kind of motion sickness called the Sopite syndrome. We'll talk about that in a bit. But Caban is a good example. He, you know, at the end, they had a microphone that they would talk into in, in case we lost the laptop. We, he would, he would, they were supposed to re, re, repeat their scores as they appeared on the screen. And he must have thought he turned it off. He was always giving this answer to the fatigue question. Are you tired? They indicated one through seven. And he was, just, he was a three, always a three, always ready to go. And, and then at the end of the, when he was reciting his, his scores, he said, but man, I'm tired. We caught him off the cuff and he, he, he's like, you know, typical Marine astronaut pilot. You, you just don't admit how tired you are or any weaknesses. But um, well, the, the upcoming experiment we have is the Apollo, uh, or is the, is the Artemis mission. But it's based on what happened to the Apollo 11 mission. You may not realize it, but um, the, it was incredibly close to catastrophe, which would have set the US space program back decades, I think. Um, as they landed the lunar module, the computers were, were not up to, to the what they're asking them to do. And Armstrong noticed they were about to land on the lip of a crater. This isn't a real uh, crater. It is just an artist's conception. And it would have tumbled in and killed them both. And, and I didn't realize until I started looking this stuff up that, that they, would, they stood up while they were landing it. The thing is rocking and rolling forward and back, left and right, pitching and rolling and yawing. And they're standing up, so it's, it's possible they could have moved back too far. Um, and, and plus, the, the rocket engines are creating this dust swirl as they were trying to land it and, and blowing to the left. So the little window that Armstrong had to look out was um, uh, he was seeing a, a leftward indication of, of dust. So he was overcompensating right. He was trying to land it manually. And uh, he landed on fumes. People to this day don't know how he did it, but you know, as calm as ever, he, he said, as soon as they touched down, you had no idea that he was near death. Uh, Aldrin was yelling at him like, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're drifting right, you're drifting right, as he was trying to correct for the vexion. And, and uh, then he landed and said, the eagle has landed, <laughs> as if nothing happened. Well, NASA is very much afraid of that happening again. So they've, they've uh, put out a, a call and, and made, a manual takeover of the uh, computer landing, a uh, number one priority for them. And we submitted a proposal uh, to, to tie it to our, uh, the vibrotactile belts, the haptic belts that we've developed, uh, not myself, but uh, Dr. Angus Rupert, uh, that, that allows the pilot to, to know through cutaneous sense wh where the, the ship is and, and where he is in relationship to the ground. It's like having another set of eyes, but on your skin. It's, it's mapped out all over your body. I'll show you more about that in a, in a, in a bit. Uh, but that's what I hope will be our next NASA project. Just to show you what a geek I am, I, I took a, a map of, uh, of, of Mars spread out this way. And then uh, some Swedish company had, had indicated where the hab was in the movie, The Martian, and where he had to go to find. And I, and I overlaid it with where all the landing sites that we, we've made as in the US on Mars. And remember he drove to the, uh, find the Pathfinder to get their, the uh, nuclear generator there so that he could stay warm and, and then drive all the way to Chaparelli Crater where the other rocket was ready for him. This is where Perseverance landed our latest rover with the Ingenuity helicopter. Pretty incredible stuff, but and, and we hear this a lot, not so much anymore. I think your generation is, is more interested in space and, and maybe realizes the importance of it. We're, we're not gonna attend to climate change. It's just not gonna happen. It's not in our, our DNA the, as, a, as a society. We're just gonna ignore it until it's too late. And there's not enough time or, or enough resources to do anything. So we've, we've gotta get off the earth. If you think that humanity is worth saving and many of us do, are uh, the magnificent brains that, that may be the only thing in the universe that has this kind of ability to, to, to wonder why it's here and, and to, to get to Mars, we'll all be lost. You know, something like 98% of the species that have ever lived are still have died. So uh, like Carl Sagan, we yearn to go to space. Um, Stephen Hawking uh, 
uh, about 10, 15 years before he died, said, we, we have only at most 10, about a thousand years on the earth left. Some catastrophe, technological or natural will, will destroy us. And before he died, he changed that to a hundred years. So uh, we've got to get off this rock. <laughs> Uh, Arthur Clarke, the guy that wrote 2001, said there's only two possibilities. We, we're alone in the universe or we're not. And he felt that those were equally terrifying. Okay. Space dangers. The small ones, but still deadly. I'm going to try to pull up my chat. Oh, thank you. All right. And then um, let's go on to that. This isn't really a serious problem, but it, it is painful. And it could be a serious problem. You, you can't burp in space, at least not easily, because the, the liquid uh, settles up into the esophagus and, and the gas can't permeate through it. So what you get is, is um, a very, what is called a wet burp. The gas eventually comes through, the, and, but only has this narrow opening. And so you get a lot of uh, stomach contents as well, um, creating this terrible heartburn problem. Uh, so but this is just a kind of, it's not that not a trivial question, not a life. It is. It's not trivial. It, it could be a serious problem, especially if you're throwing up in space quite a bit. Well, I think the the first, um, not so dangerous, but could be, um, is space anemia. What, we'll talk about it at length in a little bit. But there's this tremendous fluid shift uh, called the cephalid fluid shift, as as all your extracellular fluid migrates towards the head head of your body and, and leaves the fingers and the legs and, and so you get this puffy face and this uh, this uh, this uh, these these spindly like fingers and legs and arms um, and, and so you've lost a little bit of of your plasma uh, of your uh, of your fluid volume in, in, in a blood sample it goes from 10 to about eight cc's and but you still maintain the same hematocrit about 45 percent so this means you would expect it would it would be reduced by the same amount, two cc's worth of, of plasma uh, to 40, it should be a reduced number of red blood cells, but it stays the same, so we've lost red blood cells. This is a, a problem called space anemia. And, and we'll get to the other problem that's caused by um, that cephalid fluid shift, the dehydration problem in a bit. Okay, uh, the first one is, is a psychological problem. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Biodome 1 and Biodome 2. There are tremendous experiments. NASA put a lot of money in to try to figure out how people would get along in, in, in a cramped environment, uh, a habitat on another planet. And so both Biodome 1 and 2, Biodome was even better, um, were supposed to be incredibly beautiful places to live. It had, it had places where you could do agriculture, places where you could um, uh, you know, build things and, and there were wildlife and all kinds of things inside, but um, it, it failed. Both of them failed. Um, and it was yet the, the best of all possible situations. <laughs> so how, if, if we can't, if, if they failed because creatures died and uh, there were leaks and, and, but most of the squabbing between the people that live there and the management uh, about how much they should be, uh, how much air they should have and how hot it should be, it, it just became, uh, we, we see this problem a lot in, in, in the first um, Shackleton, not Shackleton, but um, uh, one of the trips to the North Pole, uh, when, when Perry uh, and, and I forget the other gentleman that he was with, they were trying to ride the ice around to circumnavigate the globe from, from the Arctic Circle, uh, and they were running low on food, um, they would just get insanely angry at each other for, for dropping crumbs that, that could be, they, they might need. And so it brings out the worst of us to be cramped up, even in the best of situations. Uh, what are we going to do when you're in a spacecraft that's incredibly crowded and people are uh, burning up from sunburn, they're getting liver failure and kidney failures, they're puking and dying from radiation poisoning. Um, it's, it's gotta, we gotta solve that problem and probably by getting there faster. Uh, this is the gateway, which is an incredible creation and it's gonna be orbiting the moon. That's sort of like a space station does on the earth, but it'll be actually useful. Um, and it's going to receive uh, the Orion spacecraft that will then go down and land on the moon and receive them again. And the crew will get resupplied and then go back to Earth. And there'll be several uh, uh, landers available to it on this. And they're going to make a, a deep space version of it shown here where um, you'll have a little bit more space, but certainly not like you would in a biodome. 
Elon Musk doesn't care about all that. He just wants to send big rocket ships up into to Mars. And the, uh, the, the SpaceX, the, the, the new one, um, it, it, he believes will be able to carry 100 passengers. And he wants to send up three or four of them a day for nine years to get to a million people on the Earth, on Mars. You know, a good number of those, those people, probably most of them will die. In, in transit, given current technologies. So um, that, that's a serious question. He, he, he said himself, he, he didn't want to, probably wouldn't go up on the first couple of <laughs> missions, but uh, maybe when the technology got better. But there's people, plenty of people volunteering to go. Okay. And there's, um, microgravity is, is this, um, uh, it, it's really, as Buzz Lightyear might say, falling with style. You know, you're moving at about the same speed around the Earth as the Earth is. And so when as the, the but just skirting along the orbit that will uh, is pulling you back, the, the spaceship starts to fall towards the Earth. But the Earth, the spot where it's going moves away from it. It has to oscillate back out and back down. So you're oscillating all the way around the planet. And that creates the same kind of motion that you would get on a boat that was at sea producing motion sickness. Uh, so that's that's what causing weightlessness. It's not really weightlessness. You're just you're in a ship that's falling, and uh, uh, so it, it 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 can also produce profound fatigue. Most of the astronauts, some seventy percent of them, uh, have very severe uh, motion sickness at the very beginning of the, of the space flight. Once they get up into orbit, but that goes away after a few days. It comes back periodically throughout the if they're up there for months, uh, but it goes away. And and instead they have this this fatigue syndrome. And I wanted to bring up what SOPIDE is. Sometimes the only symptom of motion sickness is, is this great fatigue, profound fatigue. Uh, you, you may not get sick on that roller coaster throwing up, but boy, you're tired and you don't know why. And that's even, it's so common, it's even given a name, SOPIDE, uh, SOPIDE syndrome. Uh, okay, so, so we're gonna talk about how, how to solve that uh, by solving the, uh, uh, the motion sickness problem. Uh, and, and in the early 1950s, Walt Disney came out with this incredibly beautiful, one of the only color TV shows. Uh, and it was done, unfortunately, by some uh, former German space engineers were all over it. And so they thought that humans would be terrified to be in microgravity. It would be as if you jumped off uh, or, or let's say you're in an elevator and, and the wires are snipped and it's a huge building. And as you're falling down, you, you would be um, terrified just that you're falling with a sense of, he, they thought that we would have to string ropes all over a, a spacecraft so that astronauts would have some way to hold on and, and, and overcome this feeling that they were falling, like jumping off of a, a high dive and, and, and swimming your, your way through, down to, to the pool. But it turns out that we like microgravity experience. People will pay up to $3,000, $5,000 for a trip on zero G, our parabolic flights that we have. Out, some of them are based in Florida, uh, all because of this, you know, postage stamp size vestibular organ in our, in our, um, in our ears associated with the cochlea. Uh, they even share the, the vestibular, it's called the vestibular cochlear or the auditory nerve um, when they join together back up here. And we'll talk a little bit more about them. But this, this is the source of, of motion sickness and many other things. The, uh, the semicircular canals give us angular velocity sense. And then the saccules and the otolith organ, the saccule and the utricle, give us the, um, the uh, linear acceleration. That is the response to gravity. And, and after we return, even from just a couple of weeks in space, th these people were up for a few months, but uh, the astronaut fainted, as you, you may remember that incident. Uh, and many of them, you know, they don't come out of, they wouldn't come out of the space shuttle for a few hours as they were getting used to and throwing up and getting used to my, uh, to normal gravity again. Uh, I, I'll try not to go over all of this, but I encourage you to read Scott Kelly's book. He was up there for a year and, and a very nice study because his identical twin was on the earth in similar restricted conditions. And uh, compared to him, it, it, as he said, getting back to, to earth gravity was, he had great difficulty walking because he just weren't used to the weight. He used to be able to float everywhere and he would have bouts of nausea. And uh, he, he had what's co called choroidal enfolding of the, of the uh, ep retinal epithelium. 
And, and that's a new problem in space and it's creating a, 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 a problem that it may last a lot longer than people thought. His bones is atrophied, his telomeres on, on his chromosomes have, uh, some of them had, had, had gotten even shorter and shredded quite a bit uh, associated with someone who's much older than he is. And it may lead to an increased risk of cancer, but he's just one person, not maybe it wouldn't happen to all of you if you went into space, but uh, it, it certainly is not such a good idea that we go up to space just yet until we get it right, until we figure out how to make people survive. It. The larger and the more deadlier um, space dangers are, of course, radiation. Uh, and and we it, it it's more dangerous than we thought. We had no idea what would happen beyond the Van Allen belts. The, you know, the Earth's magnetic field is so great uh, that it, it actually extends into space, creating this magnetic um, uh, shield against solar flares and against uh, galactic cosmic radiation, the, the deeper space, uh, so exploding star radiation, uh, and, and it protects us as well as does our atmosphere. Mars has very little atmosphere and no um, uh, magnetic core. It doesn't have a north and a south pole, except in, in, in looking at them. They don't have the, the uh, iron core that we do. Uh, so when they lost, launched the Curiosity rover, it had one of the most sophisticated dosimeters of, of, the, of the era, and that was but maybe 10 years ago, called RAD. And, and some really smart guy said, why don't we turn it on and see what happens when it gets out past the Van Allen belts on its way to Mars? And they found that there's something like over 600 sieverts was delivered. And they were GC, uh, uh, galactic cosmic radiation, GCRs. Uh, not not these relatively light lightweight solar flares, which are just ionic things. The, the galactic radiation is heavier particles, iron particles, and such that just blast their way through us. And if it wasn't for the Van Allen belts or the or the um, uh, the, the atmosphere, we would be pretty ripped up by those. Um, so this is the, why it's the number one danger because our body doesn't do well when um, when it gets at many sieverts. If, you know, you get particles ripping through your chromosomes uh, that's going to change your, your going to mutate uh, certain genes. Um, if it goes through your XYs, you're in big trouble. And some of this can be inherited. If it goes through just the chemical machineries in the cells, you're going to have uh, mitochondrial damage, perhaps free radical damage from that. Uh, it's inheritable, as we saw with um, uh, Mark Kelly, the, the epigenetics part of it was there. Um, uh, cancer certainly, and we'll see, can, can also uh, smash neuronal synapses. <laughs> You're beginning to see why this is not such a good idea just yet. John Glenn in 1960s, he, he was the first guy to orbit the Earth. Carpenter was the first, first guy to go up, but Glenn was um, uh, complained at first of, of fireflies, he called them, um, of phos phosphenes um, that, that he saw was, you know, press your eyes, you see little sparks, he was seeing those. Um, at great distances and, and, and even at near distances. And he, he quickly realized that NASA was beginning to question his sanity when he, when he would bring it up. So it was never talked about again and never has been since. But I believe these are the um, uh, solar radiation or GCRs that are also, that, that are just hitting his, his um, retinal epithelium and, and actually activating the, uh, the rods and the cones. Okay, and here's, imagine if you took a, uh, a, a bunch of rays from ra radiation, uh, like or a, a shotgun, and you shot high energy bolts through this dense neuronal field. You can appreciate how how that's going to cause some damage, and you don't, you don't know what kind. Um, this is a more recent study, uh, 2014, where they looked at. Um, uh, you can see the loss of dendritic spines. Um, so, in addition to being burned and nauseous and bald and diseased and breaking bones, as we'll see from crawling to get out the escape hatch, you're not going to be nearly as smart as, as um, Kelly complained about. His cognitive ability hasn't reached what it was yet years after. So how are they going to start a colony, much less open the hatch? Okay, so radiation is a big problem. We've got to solve that. Get there quickly would do that. But you'll see a lot of terms, and Becquerel is one. Uh, grays or another, or sieverts, probably more people use sieverts because it has a lot to do with, it explains more about the absorption of the human body uh, in its, its uh, tally of, of radiation. Grays are pretty close, um, but 
but becquerels are mostly for people that just care about the spread of radiation, not, not how much it's hitting people and, and, and cut, going through their body. But NASA has set a cumulative limit for astronauts' careers. If, if you, you, you can no longer go up in space if, you, if you've received a cumulative dose of one siever. And on the way to Mars, the uh, Curiosity reported 660 millisieverts just getting there and 67 millisieverts per day uh, bringing uh, the one sievert, the end of your astronaut career after just six days after landing on Mars, if you, if you survive the landing. So 500 days on Mars is pretty close to. Um, and, and look at it compared to uh, a CT scan, you know, which is a huge dose. Um, and normal background dose is this. So uh, that, that radiation is has got to be the, the number one showstopper. You're going to be, you know, sick, dying, and uh, forget, you know, bone and muscle atrophy. You're, you're going to be um, really um, impaired because of your, your sickness. So the number two danger, I've lumped together all of these different things into the effects of microgravity. We're not designed for, for microgravity floating around and, and it causes some really amazing and, and challenging problems, some pathologies. As I mentioned, the extracellular fluid, um, it just moves its way up towards the head region for some reason, we don't know for sure. And that causes all of these, which we'll talk about in turn. Um, for instance, the heart doesn't have to work that much and it shrinks. Uh, the longer you're up there, the more it shrinks um, because it doesn't have to work to, uh, and it's not getting any of that muscle pump uh, action to help help push blood along because you're not using your muscles unless you're on you know one of the exercise regimens um, so here's the picture of microgravity and shrinking the heart a bit and then you got to come back to earth here's what the puffy face looks like uh, from the cephalid fluid shift but more than that the bigger problem is is it's affecting the the, the fluid shift is now expanding the chest area and, and, and creating a, 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 a pressure that really isn't in the, in the blood volume on the aortic arch baroreceptors. And so the heart sensing an increase in blood pressure, which is really from the exter external blood pressure, it's not internal, but the heart doesn't know that, it's sensing the, the increased pressure. And so it signals to the kidneys to start reabsorbing fluid. Uh, it's, I'm sorry, start getting rid of fluid. And that's a, a quick way to, to reduce blood volume is to, is to pee a lot. But remember, you're, you're, you're already lost a lot of you know, fluid volume moving up to your upper portions of your body. And, and now you're peeing out quite a bit of it. So you're, you're really dehydrated in space. You can't drink enough to, uh, you'll get rid of it too quickly. And um, space itself is a diuretic. Okay. All right, here's, here's the, the choroidal infolding. Um, actually, it, it's called that because the, the retinal epithelium looks like an accordion. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like having macular degeneration, but all over the, the, uh, the, the retina, not just the, in the macula or the fovea. Um, and it, it, my friends think that it's optic nerve swelling and uh, swelling of the vasculature of the eye, but I think it has a lot more to do with that, that cephalid fluid shift, creating a, a situation like glaucoma. You know, it, it's swelling the, the interior portion of the eye, the, the vitreous humor, and that swelling is crushing the neurons uh, inside, the ganglion cells and the rods and cones and all the, all the uh, stuff of, of the vision. You can lose this up to one dot diopter, uh, and it, it doesn't seem to go away. It makes a piece of paper that looks like this look like this, and Mark Kelly is still complaining about it. That's another serious problem so far. Uh, then there's muscle atrophy, um, an, an incredible rate from not losing your muscles, 20% loss of muscle mass uh, in five to 11 days. Of course, that's if you're not exercising. And so to counter that, NASA requires two and a half hours of intense exercise uh, to keep the muscles um, uh, in shape. And, and it, it doesn't keep them in shape. It slows down the muscle loss. At some point, there's you're not going to continue to lose muscles where there's nothing. You, pretty soon, your, your body just stops absorbing the, 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 act of the muscle. But, um, you know, these guys are bungee strapped to a, to a treadmill. So it's doing nothing to your bones. And it's only really working your, your legs muscles. So you've got a 
do also do some leg lifts, but how are you going to do all that exercising in, the, in this Orion capsule? You know, it, it's we got to think this through more. That's why NASA is just making plans to go to the moon. Only Musk is making plans to go to Mars. God bless him. I think we need to, to get to Mars, but uh, not before it's safe. Uh, bone demineralization is one of my favorite problems because I think we have a solution for it. As you know, there's a constant battle between the osteoblasts trying to make bones and the osteoclasts trying to trying to break them apart and send calcium out to the all the other systems that need it, the, the, the muscles and the nerves and 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 bo other bone places. So this this constant battle is affected by microgravity. We lose bone, and there's uh, correspondingly there's an increase in urinary calcium levels and and, and blood calcium which as you may immediately know is one of NASA's biggest fears is kidney stones. As, as unpleasant, and that's putting it mildly, I've never had them, but I've then helped people who have, uh, as kidney stones are on the earth, passing shards of calcium crystals uh, through your, your penis is, is not pleasant or, or your urethra. So uh, it's gonna be even more unpleasant on, on, in, in space. Because you're, you're just, you're bungee strapped. You don't get that, that, uh, that pressure of pounding on a pavement when you run, that piezoelectric benefit from a, a bone um, to, to encourage the osteoblasts to do more than they are. And so the osteoclasts don't lose much of their ability. They just go right, uh, right on. But the osteoblast activity in microgravity is decreased. Finally, countermeasures. Uh, well, Faster engines, we've said that a couple of times. You gotta get there faster. So we don't get exposed to so much radiation. We don't have to suffer through, through uh, microgravity effects, uh, the two big killers. Uh, we could design these big giant biodomes in space if we wanted to just keep people orbiting the earth or perhaps send these giant things to, to another planet like in the movie Passengers. I hope you see that movie. It's really, I, I liked it a lot. Um, but uh, I heard a, 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 an architect speak when I was in, in graduate school. His name was Paolo Solari, and he, he lived in a commune in, in the desert of Nevada uh, and talking to, uh, to about his plans for Arco Santi, this one building city that would be in space or on ships. And, and it was just a, a, an incredible idea. I never, never even imagined anything like that before. But that may be the salvation for humanity is to get enough of us out there right away and still within the Van Allen belt, so we can at least suffer only limited solar radiation. Another friend of mine in, in the physics department here, we have a great astrophysics department, suggested that we ride taxis, asteroid taxis, that um, there, some of them orbit Mars and Earth continually every couple of years. And we could, you know, dig into the, into the surface of these asteroids and make little hotels under the, uh, and protect ourselves from radiation that way, speeding along at, 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 at rates we wouldn't be able to achieve with ordinary rocket power. And then we would, you know, when it's getting close to landing or coming to Mars or Earth, we'd get out and land on Mars on our spaceship. Incredible idea. And I think a, a, an excellent countermeasure idea. Then there's always um, Bill Nye, the science guy, uh, who's really, he's, he's the president of the Planetary Society now, of which I am a proud member. And we, everybody who contributed, helped launch Light Sail 1 and 2. Uh, and and um, Light Sail 2 is still out there and flying around orbiting the Earth. But if given enough time, the photons that hit it are going to, to drive it faster and faster and faster along its, its path to, and they were able to redirect light sail too. So it, it's something you, by coiling up one end, you know, waffling the engines or the, the wing a bit as the Wright brothers flight used to do, they would just kind of pull on the wires of their airplane and warp the, the, the wing enough to where they had some control over it. Uh, and that's what we would have to do here is warp the, the wings a bit to, to direct the sail. But a, a clever idea. Um, there's also some radiation countermeasures in the works. One of them is a giant magnetic field. Maybe we can generate one without carrying all that heavy iron. Uh, we'd never get one big enough in space, but we might be able to artificially generate a, a magnetic field, something like Star Trek does pretty routinely, so it must be possible. Um, the, a, a, a substance like Kevlar, um, a graphite nanofiber um, that stops bullets for, for police officers, 
um, it seems to be a pretty good way to protect instruments. They suffer too from uh, radiation exposure, from high energy particles blasting through them. So wrapping them in Kevlar, at least protecting them with Kevlar, uh, it might be another way we could protect ourselves in space. Uh, but I'd, I'd go with developing a magnetic shield. If we put our minds to it, if you put your minds to it, it, it would happen. The cephalid fluid shift. Um, it's, it's so much, it seems so simple to solve. We have this problem in the Air Force uh, when I worked for them and, and we invented, not me, but a group before me invented the advanced tactical anti-G suit. You know, when you, you suddenly weigh 12 times your weight in a high G turn, uh, you, these bladders blow up on these pants and, uh, and, the, and the stomach and, and keep your, like a big rubber band and keep the blood at your head in. So why couldn't we do that with a wetsuit for, um, to stop the fluid shift? She'd have to cover this part up, of course, to keep it from the torso. But um, what NASA's solution is, keep this in mind, as, as, as the solution, you know, it's just a, a, a tight wetsuit, not, not an uncomfortably tight one, but a tight one is going to keep the fluid from migrating towards your head. And that's going to solve all those problems, dehydration, anemia, uh, choroidal enfolding, all that stuff we talked about. NASA's solution is to have you sit in a giant vacuum cleaner uh, and pull all your, your blood down to your feet uh, to keep it from, uh, or pull, pull all the extracellular fluid down to your feet um, and it's, there's a risk of pulling all the blood too. The people often faint in this. These I, I was at Brooks when they were working on this one group, and uh, so it's called the lower body negative pressure or LBNP, and it leaves these horrible hickeys all over your legs and body down there, and it's really a dumb idea, but and very expensive. But this is what NASA has uh, to uh, as, as their solution. The other solution NASA looked at is this centrifuge, put a centrifuge on the space station, a short arm centrifuge, and you know, have daily meetings while you're experiencing 1G and, and that's supposed to help you um, overcome microgravity loss of bone and muscle. That's not been shown, but uh, that's what they think. I like this idea much better, or even this idea. Okay, for landing on the moon, remember the problem was spatial disorientation as you're the, the, the dust is swirling to your left, you're gonna be overcompensating to your right, or, but this thing is wobbling left and right, forward and backwards. And so a, a colleague of mine, Dr. Rupert, invented what's called the Rupert vest. And it's got all these little vibrotactile units in it that stimulate you um, and, and gives you a very fine graded um, uh, knowledge of where you are, you are in space and time. You don't have to keep looking at your attitude indicator to know that you're drifting uh, left of course, or you're drifting right of course, or you're a little too high or a little too low. These little vibrators would go off. And so while you're looking out the window, you wouldn't need Buzz Aldrin to be telling you, you know, you're drifting too far, you would know. Then you can't get away from it, you know, like you can when you take your eyes off your, your attitude indicator. And we've invented a way to test this by um, uh, using this leap device, which measures your, where, you, where you think the horizon is by holding your hand over it. And we took some pilots up and flew them with a bag over their head and, um, and then flew them through some extreme maneuvers. They weren't terribly extreme, but uh, challenging. And without the, the tactors, without these, this belt, vest, the um, uh, pilot had no clue where the horizon was. And red was where he thought he was and when it, in blue was where the ADSB said that they were. And you can see with the belt on, it was pretty easy to, to recover situational awareness and pretty quickly. Uh, there's some good evidence that in a, in a formation flight of high performance aircraft, you, it takes, you know, the guys are just staring at the, the, the lead planes, uh, uh, whatever, uh, trailing at wings so that they can stay in, in a tight formation flight at high speed, doing loops and rolls, all as a group. So they're just burning the, they're staring at nothing and thinking of nothing else, but, but flying that guy's wing and, uh, or that person's wing. And, and it, it's been determined that it takes about 20 seconds when they break away from the lead for them to recover their sense of situational awareness. 20 seconds is way too long to land a, a lunar lander too close. With this, the pilot's going to be in, in, in the loop all the way down and, and can jump in right away. So it makes sense to us that this would be the solution to landing. Here's my favorite. Uh, so I'll try to speak quickly of it because I could spend hours on it. Um, when I was at the Air Force, we did a study with um, a, a really incredible serotonin blocker. It was a 5-HT3 blocker called Ondansetron. 
And we were looking at it for its anti-nausea effects um, and, and, and I'm sorry, for its cognitive effects. We didn't have to do the anti-nausea effects, but it turns out it's still 20 years later, the world's um, uh, best recognized anti-nausea drug, especially for chemically induced or radiation induced nausea and vomiting. But you, you may not know, maybe you do, that most of the serotonin in the body doesn't, isn't in your brain, it's in your gut. Something like 90% of it is in the chromophin cells of, of, of the intestines. And when the gut gets stimulated, as it does in nausea and vomiting or radiation or such things, it releases serotonin. And melatonin is a metabolite of serotonin, of course, and it extrudes calcium from tissue. The fact that the pineal gland is, is calcified is, is testimony to that. You know, you get to be my age, my pineal is probably hard as a rock with all the calcium that's been pulled out of it by melatonin just because it manufactures melatonin in but it, melatonin can be manufactured anywhere that it has the enzymatic stuff to make melatonin from serotonin. And we all know that melatonin can induce daytime fatigue. This is NASA's fatigue problem. Block the serotonin with a serotonin blocker and you'll block melatonin production, uh, at least in, in the blood. Uh, and and uh, you won't have that fatigue problem. NASA's thrown better sedatives and more sleep time, but to no avail. This might do it. And it might stop the, the melatonin's effect of pulling calcium out of bone. Um, it, think of um, fluoxetin, Prozac, uh, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It's, it's on the insert, it, it says your bones may be brittle. Because you've got a lot of serotonin floating around, you're gonna be, uh, it's gonna be making melatonin, you're gonna be also pulling out. Uh, it, it affects the, um, uh, serotonin affects the, uh, the osteoblasts, reducing their ability. Here's a picture of that. This, uh, I've sent you the, the, um, uh, a PDF of the, this talk, so you can see this picture in better detail. And here's some citations for you. But um, serotonin has the effect of, of um, uh, affecting the pre-osteoblast cell and reducing their numbers. So you're not building as much bone, but it has no effect on osteoclast activity and they just go um, happily ahead, removing calcium from bone. So we think that um, you can also, not only can you stop bone loss, but that's also gonna stop the nausea and vomiting. There's a, a serotonin receptor in the brainstem that uh, uh, uses serot serotonin-3. The, the osteoblast serotonin is 1B, serotonin 5-HC 1B. Okay, so another countermeasure is to start building biodomes on, on Mars, on the moon, as we saw in 2001, uh, uh, or, or in space, and get good at it, and now. Or, and, and send a string of, this is Bill Nye's idea too, or at least his, his panel, uh, to send these, uh, you know, halfway to Mars, a third of the way to Mars, three quarters of the way to Mars, then orbiting Mars. And you'd break up that journey by keeping some people within the Van Allen belt. You'd then uh, migrate to every couple of months to the next station where you'd have artificial gravity. You could recover and get, uh, this is a great solution to getting us there now is these, uh, these space stations. The, the, and we'll see that this is the real solution to all those microgravity problems we talked about is a, a spinning uh, artificial gravity spaceship. Of course, we got to send robots to Earth um, and to start exploring Earth-like planets. Hubble, the telescope Hubble uh, on that on the Hubble spacecraft, I'm sorry, on the, on the mountaintop, identified hundreds of new exoplanets. We can send rovers to them and, and, and find out. This is the, uh, the solution to the microgravity problems, artificial gravity. If you remember this scene, let me just run it for you from 2001. That's just a small snippet, but notice the aircraft or the spaceship has to turn at the same rotation speed as the as the spinning of the spaceship. It's, this is 1968 when they made this movie. The, the people that that made this movie, uh, Stanley Kubrick, really had a tremendous uh, intelligent group of people writing for him. So it's rotating in line with the, the the door opening to the spacecraft, and it'll look like it's not moving. It's not turning. It's here. This is their view. They're seeing it because they're rotating. And you get to listen to Strauss while you're doing that. Uh, so this is gonna solve most of the problems. Only the artificial, uh, only the radiation problem would remain. And NASA refuses to do this. This way we could keep people in space for 
three or four years, five or six years, you'd have microgravity in the center and normal Earth gravity in the outside. And if you're like Werner von Braun, you could make something like this. Well, actually, he didn't come up with this. He came up with the idea of a space station, a space wheel. But future later versions of it have you know escape pods all over the place, and and it's a much bigger entity. This is the way to solve the problem. And but of course, Elon Musk has come to the rescue. With um, he's going to send several of his new uh, SpaceX uh, ships, uh, three of them. One will be a supply ship, and the other two will dock out here, and they'll rotate all the way to Mars, creating artificial gravity in the extreme ones and, and maintaining microgravity in the center. Very, very clever. A couple of these um, uh, starships, three of them tied together like this. So Musk is thinking of Mars. NASA is not. Uh, I think NASA should really get out of the way and stop spending all the billions of dollars they spent on the now 10 year delayed space launch system and let people like Musk and, and Bezos get more involved, make it competitive. Those guys are really competitive with one another and, and that's what it's all about. Um, all right. So there, <laughs> I've um, I presented some ideas on, on space and let's stop this. So you can see how excited I am having a, uh, done all this talking, I, I hope you're as, as, as a quiver as I am about uh, the possibilities of, of getting to space. It's possible with artificial gravity, with, with rotating spaceships, with, um, with magnetic fields generated from a spaceship, um, uh, it's possible. Your generation could get to space. Oh, uh, okay, so good question, serotonin blockers. And, as I said, it's, it's going to be tough not to get me to stop talking about it. But um, it, it, it's uh, first off the fact that serotonin um, um, reuptake inhibitors, you know, that's how they work. They keep a lot of serotonin at the synapse and they work as, a, uh, as an antidepressant. So the, the, the question really is asking if we if we um, if, if serotonin seems to be needed for people not to get depressed. But that's only if you believe the fact that serotonin is actually causing the antidepressant effect of uh, Prozac. Um, and there's strong evidence that there isn't. Those reuptake inhibitors are very powerful. And within, a, within 24 hours, you, you're, you stop producing serotonin. And yet it takes months, weeks for the antidepressant effect to show up. If in those people for whom it does show up, it's, it's only effective in 50, maybe 60. Uh, but the, the drug companies pushed it so hard uh, that at one point, 50 percent, over 50 percent of the adult population of the United States, uh, uh, you know, that were uh, in their 20s and, and 40s were on were on Prozac. And it's not it, most of them are off now because it just doesn't work. It's not whatever. If it does work, whatever it's doing, it's not serotonin. This gave serotonin the label as the happy drug, but it's it's not. You know, it's not going to take a normal person and make them happy. A happier. It, it, it's not even going to take a, a, a depressed person to make them happy. It's just going to make them not depressed. But with that many people on Prozac, it's likely we were treating unhappiness. We're not treating clinical depression. But there's, there's a big controversy about that. I encourage you to, to read that, to look that up. Um, so a, a serotonin blocker isn't going to have any effect except um, uh, keeping you from keeping your brainstem vomit center from um, firing up the vagus and creating stomach contractions. Sir, you had a question. There, somebody's hand was up. Any other questions? Do you think it's ethical to send up 300 people a day for nine years to Mars, knowing that 90% of them, but oh, no, that's too much. Let's say, let's be kind, 40% of them are, gonna be, are, are only gonna make it. And probably 20% of that 40% is probably gonna wish they didn't make it. <laughs> They're gonna be sick and burned and, and miserable. Well, we did that in, 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 seven, in the 1600s when the, the, the British industrialists were sending over shipload after shipload of, of people who were going to grow tobacco for them and, and harvest other crops and, and knowing full well that they couldn't supply them with food, they would have to fend for themselves. And a great number of them, most of them died at the hands of Indians from starvation, from, from diseases. And that's what we're sending these people. It's the same thing. Maybe it was, that's what it would take to get people to, to America. 
you could argue it's not a good thing that Europeans came and settled America and killed off all the Indians or a great number of them. Um, and, and well, we should, <laughs> but uh, it, it may be the only way to get to Mars. It's gonna take that kind of sacrifice. Uh, or we, you guys come up with a solution and argue for it, convince your, your politicians that we have to get people off this planet if we think that the human race is, is worthy of saving. And I do, and you do as well. We, you wouldn't be in the profession that you're in. Okay. Well, I've got some other questions if we're going to do this. The um, things that I thought were worthy of discussion questions. The, um, oh, the bed rest problem. NASA has this for the last uh, almost 70 years. It's, it's had the, the, a microgravity simulation uh, that they're, they're really fond of. And tell me how much you think this is microgravity. This is one, you know, to, to study something on Earth, you have to have a good analog of it. And, and there really isn't any, any for many of these space problems. But NASA's solution for microgravity is to put your head down 10 degrees and, and um, keep you there for a couple of months. You know, six months is just getting started, maybe a year. And, and all that's going to do is start that cephalid fluid shift. Your body's going to just drain fluids towards your head region. But that's not really all the changes you're, you're getting in space, you know, and, and besides that, you're, you're not getting the solar cycles every 90 minutes of sunrise, sunset, your circadian rhythms are uh, out, of, out of control. You've got, um, as well, you've got um, motion sickness in, in microgravity. So part of that, we, we proposed, and NASA quickly decided they didn't want us to do this. A uh, friend of Olina's <laughs> trying to help me with the proposal a couple of months ago, but we wanted to put a head, 10 degree head down tilt. And, and then we wanted to rotate them in, in a platform that would rotate at, at making them motion sick. And then we'd put them in a room that we control the light dark cycle for every 90 minutes. That would have been really like microgravity effects, or at least closer than what they've been using for 70 years. And NASA said, we didn't have an expert on our group that knew how to do head, 10 degree head down tilt. How hard is it to do 10 degree head down tilt? Anyway, uh, you, you stop paying attention to NASA. Start listening to uh, and Musk and, and Bezos and even the, the mad British guy, whatever his name is, uh, the Virgin Galactic guy. Um, but all of those people are visionaries. And, and I think that their vision is much better than NASA's right now. I, I, in the experiment we did with NASA, there was, um, it's probably sacrilege to talk about NASA this way, but I, I, I was in Huntsville when, when we were, we were running that experiment and I had to talk to the astronauts, but I couldn't talk directly to the astronauts. I had to talk to a manager. We talked to a manager. We talked to a manager who talked to the astronauts about my question. Did you get the recording that we asked for? You know, it, it's just nuts. There's too many layers upon layers upon layers and they don't realize what's going on at the bottom. Uh, I'm grateful to NASA for all that they've done, but um, time to get out of the way. No, it's not. The serotonin blocker is not being used on ISIS right now. I've, I've tried very hard to get NASA interested in it. And when I send it to them, they say, well, this is a, a fatigue problem. So they send it to the fatigue people and they read it and see it's bone loss. And they go, well, it's a bone loss problem. Let's send it to the bone loss people. And the bone loss people reject it because it's, it's, um, uh, it's radiation, you know? So it's, it's just, it's nuts, you know? And, and, he's, and as I've explained it to you, it makes sense, I hope, that um, you could solve this is my problem. I think it's too much like that the commercial, the wild guy gets out and says, it's gonna solve bone loss. It's gonna solve radiation sickness. It's gonna solve your fatigue problem. And it might even help your muscle atrophy because now you can, uh, now you can lift stuff rather than run on a treadmill. You know, now you can do other kinds of exercises. It's gonna keep you more active. Um, so, uh, and it's gonna stop kidney stones. <laughs> uh, Anyway, so, and so NASA rightfully probably looking at me like that wild crazy guy with all the question marks on his jacket on those late night commercials. Maybe you don't have the same commercials we do. Anyway, I, I, I've included my name and, and, and email address. And, and if you, if you, I encourage you to, to start thinking about this stuff. If we've got to get, if not you, your kids off and, and onto Mars and, or you know, other places. Oh, good question. Is, is there a lot of bureaucracy around space? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that's the reason we have a space station. 
You know, a lot of us in the planetary society were arguing, don't build it orbiting the earth, build it on the moon. You know, build build a habitat, get good at it and make it make it something we could survive in and, and then then move into space. Um, but instead, they built a space station because they're in every state of the union, the United States, every state has some hand on something to do with the space station. And many countries do. So they got a lot of money to do this. Um, if I had a choice, <laughs> I would take it in a heartbeat. You know, I would kind of like Buzz Aldrin uh, when, when um, Buzz Aldrin said, you know, send, send old guys to Mars. Don't send the young people. Let them figure out the problems. But if there's a chance, we'll make it. And, and, and if we could get there, if we, if, we don't, if we don't make it, it's not such a big loss because we've had a good life. But if we do make it, then, um, you know, you can't keep an old, old person down when it comes to something that they enjoy doing. You got to see the movie Space Cowboys with um, uh, Clint Eastwood and several other really old guys who play astronauts. And, and it's, a, it's a great movie. But, yeah, I'd, I'd, go, I'd go if only to keep you guys from going. I'd sacrifice myself for you and see all that space. That would be wonderful. Mm. I realize some of you might have other classes to, to go to now, so we better better finish up. But um, on behalf of everyone, I would like to say a huge thank you to Dr. French for coming along today and giving us such an inspiring and interesting presentation. And we're so so lucky to have the benefit of um, his expertise over over such a long and fascinating career so um john thank you very very you much might live long and prosper <laughs> oh yeah i can do that too thank you very much Rowena. very nice talking with all of you and good luck to you